of circulating in. I know many of us have, including Miles, there closing the door. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not leaving. No, we met, uh, we met many years ago in, in former lives. So my name is Brian Trustee. I'm the Executive Director of Audubon, Texas. I am also the VP of the Central Flyway, which the way Audubon is organized regionally in the flyways. Isn't that nice? And the Central Flyway is a 14-state region that uh, essentially encompasses a great part of the Midwest and, and the Rocky State. So I'm here to talk to you today about our conservation ranching program, which is a program that we've been piloting for the last four years. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, and, we, and we'll kind of talk about a lot of its details because it is fairly complex. So again, we're talking about the sweet, the landscape of North American grasslands, which essentially is a little over 300 million acres that stretches from southern Canada all throughout the U.S. down into northern Mexico. And, and traditionally, these grasslands, may, as you know, managed themselves historically through two major natural functions. And that was, first of all, the grazing of large herds of ungulates, and two was fire. And of course, over the last 100, 150 years, we've done a really good job of bastardizing the heck out of one and completely suppressing the heck out of the other. <laughs> Next. So I'd like for you to read this slide for just a second. If I had one thing I wanted you to walk away with uh, in this discussion, it's that we believe that it's going to take this duality of both the incentives and the programs that come out of the Farm Bill and the state-based incentives, coupled with market-based strategies that are really going to achieve grassland conservation at scale in North America. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that as we get further along. But the important thing here, in, in order to market-based strategies mean we're engaging private landowners and private leaseholders and conservation practices on their land, and there's an economic incentive from the market for them to be able to do that. Because this last statement is the most important thing, is that we have to keep them on the land, and they have to be able to make a living in doing so. So this is the suite of grasslands within North America. As you can see, as I mentioned, it stretches from southern Canada down to northern Mexico. And what we did starting four years ago was began developing pilot sites throughout the, this suite, because what this is, as you know, is not one big um, uh, monoculture of, e of grasslands. In fact, it's, it's an interconnected web of, of related ecosystems that constitute the greater suite of grasslands. And essentially, Audubon's working in five major grasslands. One is tall grass prairie, two is mixed grass prairie, three is short grass prairie, and then the coastal prairie here, and then the Chihuahuan grasslands in West Texas and Northern Mexico. We developed, we needed these pilot sites in which we were developing range management and livestock management protocols. These are standards and protocols in which private landowners and leaseholders can manage their livestock on the land in such a way that it produces high quality and maintains high quality prairies and grasslands. As I'll get into a further detail later, why we needed these multiple um, pilot sites that spread out throughout the entire suite of grasslands is because our protocols need to do two things. One, they need to be consistent within each other for the integrity of the program itself. And two, they also needed to have an element to allow them to be ecologically tailored down to a local ranch site and the unique ecosystem in which it is, uh, operated. Here in Texas, we have the great privilege and pleasure of working with two folks, Katy Perry being one, Thank you guys very much for being a pilot site and helping us develop those protocols around uh, managing livestock on southeast coastal prairie. And then, of course, our uh, friends at Fix and Water Foundation and the MIMS unit out in Marfa developing uh, protocols around the Chihuahua grasslands. So we'll get more into protocols as we get further along. And this map actually demonstrates, kind of illustrates where we are now trying to expand our pilot sites. This is not intended to be a geographically scalable accurate as to all the ranches we're trying to bring into the program, but it is geographically where we're trying to grow our pilot sites. Our goal right now, which is one that is being finalized as we finalize our national strategic plan that takes Audubon through 2020, uh, Joy Hester is on our national board, she'll be a part of that process in January, and Steve is on our state board here in Texas, uh, is also contributing to that process. We're hopeful, at this point, we're aiming to bring five million acres under this program within the next five years. And, we, and to do that, we are engaging partners in Mexico, all throughout the US and Canada. So this really is a story about ranchers, right? Because their challenge, go ahead, uh, their challenge is immense, and they face great economic um, 
challenges and being able to manage their land in, in a uh, sustainable way, uh, but certainly under a lot of the uh, incentives to do otherwise and, and produce put yield over quality of, of uh, range management. And so we really want to work with those ranchers to be able to keep them on the land and do what they do best. But at the same time, they also know from that we also know that, and as they tell us, um, there's areas in which are not their expertise, and that is growing new markets, being able to stitch together new supply chains, and so that's where Audubon really is trying to add value. When we started working with private landowners, whether they were in North Dakota or in Wyoming or in Texas, we didn't exactly know how they would receive us, and so we, we kind of parked close to the door and we were ready to make a run for it. <laughs> um, but I, this pragmatic approach of just starting off recognizing we get the fact that we need you need to stay on the land. We want your family to stay on the land. We want you to make a living, and not just a meager one. We want you to make a good living at what you do. And it's, it was, we're not a conservation organization that views success by standing at your gate, wagging, wagging our finger at you, telling you how you manage your land. We do want to dig in and roll up our sleeves with you. So that was really a part of that story. So I wanted to share, I put this picture in here because this really demonstrates the example of one versus the other. This picture is provided to us by a partner of ours, I think it was a partner probably of several folks in the room, and that's Pro Natura Norveste, based in Monterey, Mexico, and it's through them that we're working in the Chihuahua grasslands in that landscape. So this is two ranches literally down the road from each other. The one on the right is, is a pilot site participating in this program. The one on the left is your traditional overgrazed ranch. So it's clearly, I mean, the evidence is overwhelming, the, the difference of the landscape and how that works. So now well, let's talk about the extent of the problem, which is probably something that this crowd in particular is incredibly familiar with, but we'll go ahead and talk about it as a context. Uh, again, as I mentioned, uh, the suite of North American grasslands really is a little over 300 million acres, and 46% of that's been lost over the last 100 to 120 years to row crop conversion. Because of misguided federal policy and perverse and economic incentives, within the last 10 years, 24 million of that 124 was added. And so essentially this is, agriculture by far is one of the biggest threats to native grasslands. And so if we're going to have a market-based strategy, I think we probably need to have one that also embraces some form of agricultural practice in that intersection. So row crop conversion, a major, major threat to grasslands. Next, uh, within the last 10 years, we've also lost an additional seven, almost seven and a half million acres to oil and gas production. Uh, if you were in the presentation before, when we talked about oil and gas production, that this seven and a half million acres that was lost predominantly in the Dakotas because of the Bachman play was, um, it's just from roads, pad sites, and refineries. It's not the overall issue. And, uh, and Audubon worked with industry, and industry was very receptive, as we talked about, of reducing the footprint of development. And as we are creating more of a cooperative environment around conservation that industry sees a bottom line result in for themselves, this is something that we really do want to bring them to the table because they're power, they can be a powerful ally. And so just as, a, just as a note, that's something that's very important to us. And then, of course, due to fire suppression and so many other things, in the last 10 years, we've also lost almost 12 million acres in woody encroachment in Oklahoma alone just to red cedar. Mm -hmm. So this co combination comes to 149 million acres. We're not even talking about other things like climate or urbanization or anything else. Mm -hmm. This 149 million acres is the same size as the entirety of Central America plus the Mexican state of Chiapas. That's what we've lost in terms of a um, the native landscape in North American grasslands. That's what makes grasslands officially the most endangered ecosystem in North America, of which the most endangered ecosystem is Blackland Prairie that exists right here in Texas, where less than one-tenth of one percent remains of that original 50 million acres. And of course, you would expect to see a biological response to such significant habitat loss. So this is from the recent State of the Birds report. I've pulled out of here, I've highlighted the suite of grassland birds. It's seen a 40 percent decline since 1968. Uh, they were the uh, suite with the largest decline, and except for the last five years, it was surpassed by arid land birds. And visiting with a number of um, ornithologists about that fact, actually these two things are very closely related because arid land birds often rely on grassland habitat as part of their migratory corridors. 
But there is light at the end of the tunnel. And I wanted to show this to you because this, was, this is wetland birds, right? So what happened in the 1990s was this huge focus around wetland mitigation and restoration projects. And look what happened biologically. So the point is here is it doesn't have to be a doom and gloom picture. We've actually shown through history that when we have a focused effort and targeted effort on specific types of habitat mitigation and restoration, there can be a very fast and dramatic biological response. So we, yes, we can do something about this decline in grassland and arid land groups. So what is our overall strategy? All right, it's complex. Uh, and that is there is no silver bullet to conservation at scale in North American grassland. <coughs> so, um, we are looking at the policy side of the next iteration. We heard Chuck mention earlier, and we have another farm bill that's going to be coming up in a few years. And in this next farm bill, there's an opportunity for, to borrow Mary Ann's theme from our earlier discussion, much stronger cooperation in the conservation community to make sure that's something that's more strongly re resounding in the next farm bill, but also these state-based incentives and any opportunity we can get there. And our partnerships with NRCS and NIFWIP and Fish and Wildlife, other NGOs, we do have to all work together. It does take a village because it's going to be something that uh, we can achieve much better scalable outcomes when we work together. Then there's the market-based strategy. And for Audubon, it's conservation ranching. I'm going to come back to that. Uh, but we also have a, you know, a really strong effort around not just generating but facilitating through partners great science that are addressing the impacts of climate on grassland habitats and grassland species the intersection of agricultural best practices with conservation best practices, and then, of course, the resultant um, land cover changes from various other things, whether it's climate or agriculture or what have you. And then finally, also, this if we're going to achieve conservation on a continental scale, we've got to be able to put together the partnerships that bring our partners in Canada, our partners in Mexico, because we really, it is one big, the birds don't care. Um, so... So back to market-based strategies. Why is this so important? And here's why. 85% of those 300 million acres are owned by private landholders. And of the 15% that are actually publicly held, a vast amount of those are under management of private leaseholders. And so if we're going to actually achieve conservation at scale in grasslands, we've got to be able to engage private lands and private <coughs> leaseholders in doing so, and it has to make economic sense to them. We can't always rely upon the generosity of state or federal government to subsidize conservation practices. We actually have to create a market opportunity that drives that, opportunity, drives that practice. So what we're hopeful for in our impact is that we create grassland ranching standards or protocols that really guide sustainable production and produce a premium food product that can demand a premium in the market. Uh, we also have the responsibility of monitoring and evaluating those standards. So to make sure that they're actually producing uh, the ecological and biological responses that they're intended to. That we don't, we're not sloppy or lazy into just producing standards and then walking away. We really got to monitor it and make sure we're getting the bird and, and wildlife response we're hope, hopeful for. And then the opportunity to leverage a brand like Audubon or other NGOs that drive consumer interest in this. Okay. So what is the bird response? I mentioned we've been doing pilots for the last four years. Uh, and I'm going to share with you some very brief uh, results on our pilot sites in Missouri. So we had 12 pilot sites in Missouri that we were working with. And in, in the mo monitoring efforts that followed uh, over the last three to four years, we found in the cases where there was both native plants, native prairie, native uh, grasslands, and uh, sustainable grazing practices, we saw a three, three times the amount of biodiversity just in the bird species alone and five times the amount of bird density than the sites that were either uh, non-native or um, not either of the two at all. So this is really clear to us about the results that we see on the ground. So here's kind of what we're managing for. What this graph shows is a couple of different things. On the top, we show varying levels of grazing density. On the bottom, we show the density of shrub and, and um, vegetation. What you see here are the various life cycle needs of these species. And so I mentioned this is life cycle needs. So keel deer, for example, throughout their entire life cycle really only need bare, or short, bare ground or short grass. Greater prairie chicken, on the other hand, needs that whole spectrum throughout its entire lifespan. It relies on various levels of vegetation density throughout its life. 
So what we've learned in this process of our pilot studies, it isn't, doesn't matter how many cattle you put on a pasture. It matters how long you keep them there. And, that, and that's what actually mimics those humongous herds of bison that were roaming around the, the country a couple hundred years ago. They're doing this work for us. So what we've done through our traditional beef industry is manage the heck out of horned larks. <clears throat> but we're at the expense of really a much more uh, heterogeneous uh, ecosystem. The pilot sites are the sites that we were not in, in our pilot program, but we're monitoring as controls. What we found are continuing to slowly slip into an ecological monoculture because this they tend to live at this end of the spectrum. Next. So I love to see the discussion that Alan started this morning in our keynote around really introducing the next generation to this issue. So this is. The Mims Ranch uh, there in Marfa that's managed and owned by the Dixon Water Foundation. It's a huge educational component for kids uh, in the area because nobody from Dallas or Houston's making the field trip all the way out there. But uh, certainly it's for the folks in Fort Davis and Marfa and Presidio, it's a great opportunity. What, one of the things that Robert Potts would tell you if he was here, and is he here? Have you seen Robert? Okay. If, is, if, is the not just the importance of what's happening above ground, but the importance of these practices is about what's happening below ground, because it's also about watersheds. And what they've learned out there through their, the, their pilot work is that it's one of the best ways to create resilience in the landscape against another emerging threat, particularly in the West, and that's desertification. Next. So how this program works, and I know I've kind of rapid fire through all this. This is where it gets actually really complicated. I've mentioned these protocols several times. And I'd like for you to envision them as a manual that has five chapters. So this, as I mentioned before, we have to do, we have to accomplish two things with this. We have to uh, accomplish consistency and then differentiation. So they, like, these things are almost even at odds for each, with each other. The first four chapters accomplish this consistency. So it doesn't matter whether a ranch or a farm operation is in North Dakota or whether it's in um, Wyoming or in Texas or even Mexico. These four chapters are all the same. That creates consistency in how farms or ranches are operated. Their management practices, how they receive and respond to expert advice and mentoring, how they do planning and record keeping, and then just some other basic land use practices. The pilots that we've had the privilege of working with, particularly here in Katy Prairie, have been educating us a whole lot around a lot of this so that we can be able to turn that out and replicate it at scale across the landscape. That fifth chapter is the one that's different, based on whichever, wherever the ranch is located. Because though that fifth chapter is built around the habitat needs of specific target grassland bird species. Why birds? Because we're all about But we also <laughs> recognize that birds are a great proxy to the overall health of that entire ecosystem. So we start seeing responses in bird populations first uh, that are really visible and easy to see compared to some of the other uh, aspects of that habitat. So, and that's how, so what, it's short grass prairie or southeast coastal prairie, this will be slightly different but depending on where it's located. And that helps that local rancher, that local producer, really feel at home with these standards. This slide has a lot going on, but I'm gonna explain it from left to right. So this left column is, that's really audible. We own the standards, we own the responsibility of continuing to evaluate the success of the standards and those will evolve over time. We also uh, are in the process, and right now in the process, of selecting the folks that are in this middle column, which are the certification partners. So Audubon is a conservation organization, we're not an auditing organization. And we don't want to get into, the, I know Joy and Steve will both appreciate hearing me say this, we're not going to get in the business of auditing ranches. That's not what we do. But what we do want to do is select appropriate partners that can help do that work for us. And we want to ask that, that those partners also come to the table with the appropriate set of animal welfare standards. And I have to explain that a little bit as well. And Audubon is very interested in animal welfare, but we're a conservation organization. Mm -hmm. So we want to choose partners who have, and animal welfare standards are a wide spectrum. We want to choose animal welfare uh, partners with animal welfare standards that fit the right spectrum for us that we feel like is still pragmatic and not onerous to the producer 
in such a way that they're still very, eth uh, have the ethical treatment of animals going on in their operation, but they're also still able to make a living, and it's pragmatic and realistic. And then our job is to actually audit those certifiers who are doing annual audits on the ranchers that are participating in the program to make sure that they're sticking to the standards. The farmers and the ranchers on the other side, you know, if they participate in the program, uh, then they have the opportunity to uh, be a part of a supply chain that we're helping to try to create and facilitate and potentially have a mark on their product in the meat counter and the retailer that features the Audubon brand or logo that helps tell that story. So when, what we're testing at this point and what we've tried to find out is that, that the presence of that brand demands a premium for that product so that that landowner, that producer gets paid a premium for this work. Okay. So the market trends and how we know this is headed in the right direction. You can go ahead and click one more time. Excellent. So over the last 15 years, the annual sale of grass-fed beef has grown 400%. Now it's a $2 billion segment of the beef industry. Now that $2 billion segment, again, is, represents still only about 4% of the entire beef industry. But it's still a noticeable, uh, certainly a respectable number. But all the retailer and industry experts that we're working with saying in the next 10 years that's going to grow to almost $20 billion as a segment of the beef industry. So the trend is going in the right direction. Can you give me two more clicks. So the other piece of this is that, you know, in visiting with USDA and NRCS, they want to partner on a local level with these types of grazing standards, and they're putting their money where their mouth is. So in the Missouri area alone, they've established a $5 million grant fund for ranchers in Missouri and surrounding states to help support the cost of transitioning to holistic grazing practices, because there is a cost of doing so. And you know, also as a testament to where private philanthropy is in this work, we've been successful in raising $2 million in the last four years to support the costs of this pilot phase. Uh, it's not enough to keep growing the pilot phase, and we're con con continually trying to grow, uh, grow that uh, philanthropic success. Because the one thing that's important here is we don't want this to cost the landowner anything. We want very low barrier of entry. So as a conservation organization, one of our core competencies is fundraising for conservation. We try to help cushion that blow for the landowner. It does take both sides, though. And we really, uh, you know, working with NRCS and to expand this type of model throughout the rest of the country is something that's important to us. Yeah. So here's a couple of things that I want to leave you with. And these are not final, so don't walk away with them thinking they're final. <laughs> this is just an example of what some brand images could look like. And what we're doing right now is we're going through a series of pretty rigorous consumer testing. Uh, and the reason we're doing that is we know that Audubon is one of the more trusted brands in conservation akin to the Nature Conservancy. Uh, and we know that the uh, value of that brand presence on a product can add market appeal to that product. So I want to tell you a brief story as it relates to this, and that is that and part of this process is working with the retail side of it and making sure that we're preparing every step of the way in the supply chain to be able to deliver that product from the rangeland to, to the retail. And um, I'll just come out and say one of the retailers that we've been working heavily with is HEB, of course, which has a huge presence in Texas. And their director of meats, who lives in San Antonio, and I had a conversation, our last conversation in August. And um, what he shared with me was something that was pretty interesting and, and adds credence to why this is important. HEB has three lines of premium meats. And, they, and that most major retailers like HEB have the same three lines. Those three lines of premium meats are fast growing, they're growing at double digits every year, they're the fastest growing segment of the meat market. But they're not all growing at the same rate. And the reason why that is, is because the story of each one of them is different. The one that's growing the most it, right now is antibiotic free. And that's pretty easy to figure that one out. And the nanosecond that goes in a consumer standing in front of a meat counter makes a choice of one product versus another. Antibiotic free says there's no chemicals in that food. And obviously, that's something that appeals to a lot of people. The second one that's growing second fastest is organic. And again, that's pretty self-evident also, because the organic consumer has been well-trained by now, and they know what they're looking for. The third one, the third line, and again, it's still growing at double-digit figures every year, but it's growing slower than the other two, 
is what they call sustainable product. And this type of beef or meat or lamb would fall in that category. And the reason why he says it is is because it's so much more complicated of a story to be able to tell the consumer. So, however, HEB also does loyalty studies. And they study the consumer purchasing patterns of them coming in week, every week and buying the same product for a minimum of two months. And of those three lines of premium meats, what he shared with me, is that the sustainable products have the highest customer loyalty. So what that says to us is that the journey a consumer makes to make a, a sustainable food purchase is the longest because the story is the most complicated to digest. But once they get there, they stay there, which means that we need help in telling that story. And what we're hopeful for is that the presence of a well-known conservation brand will start that process of changing the conversation. Next. So for us, it really is about a benefit to birds. If for birds, this is a major crisis. I mean, as you can see in the State of the Birds report, and it's a major crisis that's linked to the habitat issue. It's an op opportunity for us as a part of this conservation community to lend our brand to help shape consumer behavior. So we have this real gigantic uh, demographic called millennials that are um, huge uh, consumer base. They are not very strong in, in supporting conservation uh, through philanthropy. Either one, that's just not, they're not at that life stage yet, or two, it's just not how they actually show uh, support for a cause. But what they are very good at is showing support for a cause through consumer behavior and, and purchasing decisions. And that's how we can start creating market incentives to be able to uh, have more sustainable production on the land. So we're hopeful that that actually creates a much stronger relevancy for conservation in the next generation. And that is my presentation. to give you, and it is at time, but may I take a couple of questions? I have one. Um, what is the, is there, has there been communication between you and the folks who do the rainforest uh, seal of approval on coffee, uh, and what have they learned that they might have been able to pass on to you in terms of marketing this kind of thing? Sure, can we get, get the lights all the way up? Um, well, Mark, it's not, a, it's not an automatic win. It takes, you know, shade-grown coffee was something that it's been uh, very successful, and Audubon's been a part of that as well, as we have our own brand on a version of Shape Run Coffee. Uh, one of the things that we've learned through that is that there is a propensity for consumers to really respond to it, but you've got to be able to tell the story, and telling the story doesn't just stop at putting your mark on the product. And so one, th one of the things that we're, we are wrestling around with right now is what's the rest of it? What's the rest of the effort we need to put into marketing why this is important, why this is something consumers should pay attention to. Good question. Yes, ma'am. Um, I realize resources are limited, but at any of these pilot sites, have you also been monitoring um, any other groups, plants, or arthropods, or anything? We, yeah, obviously, a lot of our folks are focused on the bird side of it. But we have a lot of partners, like in Missouri, our partner is the Missouri Department of Conservation. And so they're looking at that whole suite of ecology, not just the bird piece. And one thing I wanted to mention is that really it's important to distinguish, because at Audubon, we wrestled with this, and Joy could attest to that we, our board nationally has gone back and forth. Do we want to be in food politics? And are we about beef? Or what, what's the deal? <laughs> so we're not certifying beef. And that's something that's really important. What we are really certifying is sustainable land and livestock management practices. Um, and so we did struggle with that a little bit. Last question. Uh, there was a graph in our uh, depiction in your, in your uh, presentation that looked at the continuum of, of, of cattle grazing intensity mm -hmm. and what birds would appear uh, in that landscape as a conceptual model. And there were a couple along the, the, the right-hand side, the lower intensity, like grasshopper sparrow mm -hmm. and henslow sparrow, that since the late 1960s have been declining at about 5% annually. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, is there thought or what's, what's sort of the, the strategy to try to optimize losses of those continental important bird species, but also maximize potential for income generation well, it's all on how you rotate the cattle. Okay. 
and how long you keep them on certain pastures. Some some tracks don't see cattle for a year, and so you manage like and then um, Robert's case out in the MEMS unit in Marfa. So they basically take 8,000 acres and they divide it into 20 acre paddocks, and they manage the cattle on that land through through rotating them through those paddocks. Some paddocks never see grazing, and the point is to, to keep the heavy shrub density in those paddocks so that over that 8,000 acres you have the heterogeneity that we're looking for. Um, but not just, not every paddock is grazed the same way. Does that help? Yeah. Yes. Have you identified ranch sizes that are optimal for this program? You know, that's a great question because ranch sizes appear differently in different parts of the country. So in Missouri, the average ranch that we're working with is about 250 to 300 acres. Uh, in West Texas, it's eight to ten thousand. In Wyoming, it's a hundred thousand. So it's different in different places. And to answer your question in terms of optimal, it, a couple of, it needs to be at least a couple hundred acres in order to be able to manage that appropriately. Okay. Yes. So um, obviously, the very complicated puzzle. One one thing about um, bird decline, there have been some recent studies that have looked at the use of pesticides and herbicides. And so, is there anything in the protocols that that uh, look at how the application of, of chemicals on those ranches is affecting any bird population? Yeah, and that appears in those first four chapters. Uh, and then, if there's any specific aspect to it that's unique to a specific species in that ecosystem, then it would show up in the fifth chapter. Another thing that our protocols do allow for is supplemental feeding. So, and the reason why that's important is because one, it helps to lengthen out the um, production schedule. If we are solely reliant on the germination schedule of grasses to produce cattle, then this is not an economic opportunity for ranchers. So we do allow supplemental feeding in the pasture, but our protocols do not allow for those ranchers to send their cattle to the feedlot. And that's where we are not, that's where we're not um, really hitting the mainstream side of things. There's other organizations like WWF that as long as you manage their cat, your cattle up to a certain way, up to a certain point, it's okay to sell them to the feedlot. For us, that is a detraction from the conservation wins that you get from keeping them on the land. We're asking our ranchers to keep them on the land one more year and then sell them at that point. So they delay their payday by a year, but the payday is bigger when it happens. That's the part of that transitional cost we need to help and support. What's the weight on the cattle when you're able to, uh, if the rancher was to go into this program, what's the weight on the cattle? Maybe they can sell it. Well, I mean, of course, it depends on the ecosystem, but for the most part, we're trying to get cattle about between 650 and 800 pounds. Okay, just same time. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. Yeah.